We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. So if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This is, a, uh, this is a standalone message also, but it is kind of connected to the 10 More Miles series that we finished up a few weeks back. If you haven't yet had the opportunity to, uh, or you haven't taken the opportunity to write any initials on either of these chalkboards, please don't um, hesitate. I mean, don't get up right now, but after service, please come up and add names of people that you're contending for, that you're believing for, that, that they would come to Christ, that they would be healed, that they would be set free. Um, that they would be provided for. Whatever it is that you're praying, we want to include those that are on your heart with those that we are already praying for. We're going to be keeping this in front of you for the foreseeable future, and we want to include those that are on your heart in it as well. The, um, this time that we're in is, is a time of taking risks. It feels like we're in a season of taking risks. When When I say that, does anybody in the room, don't raise your hand, but does anybody feel like a little apprehension? Like most people fall into one of two categories. They're either risk takers or they are risk averse. My suspicion is is that most people would prefer not to take risks. There's a few of those out there that just, you know, they're always up for the next big thing. But most of us are like, and I in particular, I'll speak, to my, speak about myself, I in particular am not a risky, uh, not a person who likes to do th- risky things. I am definitely the, you know, the, the old saying, a bird in hand or two in the bush. I'm like the bird in hand guy. Like, I'll just take what I got and I'm good. I don't, I'm not a big risk taker. I have taken risks. I ha- and, and risks usually fall into one of two categories. They're either really foolish or if they're led by the Spirit of God, they're really wise. So when I was in high school, just to give an example of foolishness, and, and you, most of you know my story and know how I just painfully insecure I was, I, I would do anything um, to make people like me. I was, it was funny, I was nominated, what is it called, senior superlative, I was the class clown of my senior class, and I was a miserable person which is not an unusual thing, like behind the scenes, miserable, in front of people, trying to make everybody laugh. But I was riding in a car, and it was an older sedan that was a convertible. It was like a late 60s, early 70s, big, huge land yacht kind of a car. And it didn't have, you know, it it had the top down, and we were riding in front of our high school at about 50 miles an hour. And I thought, taking risks is what I'm talking about, I thought it'd be a great idea to stand up in the back of the car and put one foot on the back of the front seat and the other foot on the top of the back seat while we were going 50 miles an hour on the road. Does that sound like a foolish risk to you? I think back now, I think, what a doofus. I mean, you could have just been killed just like that. Like, one of my kids would have done that. I would have been really upset. But I was just taking risk out of foolishness. But risk-taking can also be spirit-led. Susan and I, again, even though I'm, we're both pretty risk-averse, I'm not very entrepreneurial, 20 years ago, we, we, we were blessed and, and led to plant a church that is still in existence today in another part of the United States. So when you hear from the Lord, the risk really isn't a risk. When you think about it, it's not actually very risky if you hear God say, do something, even though the doing of the the thing feels a little unsettling to you. We are in a season of taking risks. The spiritual way of saying taking risks is having a leap of faith. We are in a season of taking leaps of faith. And the thing is, about these leaps of faith, about taking risks is, is that Though God is unchanging in his character, his nature, you know, I am the Lord, I change. Just do it one more time. I am the Lord, I change. Not, right? He doesn't change. Even though his character is consistent, he does not change. He's always the same. The way that he chooses to do things in our lives is consistently unpredictable. Like the best way to find out what God's not going to do is to look what he's doing somewhere else. If we wanted to have happen here what is happening in Asbury uh, uh, University in Wilmore, Kentucky, the best thing to ensure that that doesn't happen is to try to do exactly what's going on there and ask him to give the same result because he doesn't do that. You read through the scriptures, he's constantly doing things differently, changing things up because his nature is fixed, but the way he chooses to interact with us is it's, it's constantly varied. And it's not likely, as we're praying for these people that are on represented by these initials on our chalkboard, it's not likely that we're going to experience miracles without being led to do some things that are unusual. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, God wants you to be unusual. (laughs) 
Because following Jesus was never supposed to be predictable or safe. It was supposed to be fulfilling and fruitful. And you rarely get fulfilling and fruitful from predictable and safe. And if this isn't new, this is a new concept for you, then, well, here you have it. Most of us already recognize this. Our comfort, my comfort, is not a high priority for God. He is not interested in me being comfortable. I like, personally, I personally like comfort. I, I'm inclined towards comfort. I crave, you might even say, comfort. But I can tell you this, in 30 years of following Jesus, that, that when I am comfortable, I almost never grow. And if I'm growing, I'm growing very, very slowly. If I am uncomfortable, I'm being stretched, I'm growing like crazy. Great things are happening inside of me. So we kind of have to pick. Do we want to grow and see miracles, or do we want to be comfortable? You can't really have both. That, I didn't get any amens on that. <clears throat> yeah. And I understand why. I want to give you two examples this morning of this concept that I'm talking about. Then we're going to be in Ephesians. Just really quickly, though. Joshua chapter 3. We were talking about 10 more miles. Those last 10 miles before Israel crosses the Jordan. In Joshua chapter 3, there are dis- details about how the crossing takes place. And the way that the crossing is going to take place, the way that the Jordan is going to open up for them, is that instead of like in Exodus, where Moses stood in front of the Red Sea and he raised his staff and God just whoosh, caused the sea to stand up on both sides... Unlike that, in Joshua chapter 3, the Lord tells Joshua, who tells the priest, what you're going to do is you're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the golden box that that represented the presence of God on the earth. You're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, and you're going to walk out with it on your shoulders, and you're going to step into the Jordan. And the text says that as you step into the water, it says that the water is going to stop flowing from upstream, and it's going to actually says in the ESV, it says it's going to build up like a heap. Wouldn't you like to have seen that? It's so cool. They, and it's, you know, I get the idea. It says specifically in Exodus that when Israel crossed the Red Sea, they crossed through on dry ground. I have this sense that as the priests in Joshua chapter 3 are stepping into the Jordan, that they are, they are getting into the water. You know, the water's up to their ankles. The water's up to their knees. And they had to have been thinking, Lord, any time now, you can stop this thing. We need to have this thing happen. In other words, once the water stopped flowing and they were walking through, they were walking in probably a muddy mess up to their knees until it stopped and fully drained out. There's a kind of a lesson in that for us, that sometimes seeing God do miracles in our lives causes us to have to walk in places that are uncomfortable, to get a little messy, but to persevere, to see him fulfill what he has to do through us, what he wants to do through us. It's a partnership between us and God. They waded into the water, and it was the first of many miracles that took place in the promised land. It was a simple act. All God said to do was walk into the water, It was simple, but it was unusual. It wasn't hard, but it was very weird. And it was a miracle. In Matthew chapter 24, we have a similar situation in that it involves water. Each of the gospel accounts talks about Jesus walking on the water. His disciples are in a boat, and he walks out to them. Only in Matthew's account does Peter ask if he can join the Lord on the water. And, of course, the Lord says, what's he say? Come. Yeah, he says, come on out. First of all, who even asks that? That's just, I mean, that right there, that needs to be its own message because he had the the guts, he had the courage, he had the spiritual insight, he had the faith to say, Lord, can I do it too? And he steps out on top of the water and for at least a little bit of time, Peter's faith and Peter's works were perfectly aligned and he walked on the water. At the bidding of the master, he heard the word of God And he was able to step out of the boat and walk on the water. Of course, we know that eventually he started to fall. But Peter experienced the impossible because he was willing to believe Jesus for something big. He was willing to partner with Jesus to do a miracle, be a part of a miracle. And this was just one of dozens of times that Peter's life intersected with miraculous miraculous, miraculous occurrences. So here's where I'm going with this. Whether we're talking about parting the waters of the Jordan or standing on the Sea of Galilee, the miraculous always lies on the other side of the familiar. Always. When we go beyond our comfort, we are able to experience things beyond our comprehension. But you have to go beyond what's comfortable. Nobody ever grows. Nothing ever amazing takes place. There are no miracles in the land of comfort. They're always on the other side. Now, with all that said, have you ever thought this, like, 
with your brain? Have you ever thought, that makes perfect sense. I understand what you're saying cognitively. I understand that the, what the scriptures teach. But here's the deal, Tim. How do I actually get to be a part of miracles? Like, I can believe that other people can. I can believe that it can happen in Asbury. I can believe that it's happening in Kentucky. I have a hard time believing it's going to happen here with these people that I have up there. Do you ever have that thought? Like, how, Lord? How does it work? You know, you're talking to him about people walking on water, and I'm just trying to get through the day. Does that make sense? Does that ring true for anybody? If, that, if you feel that, I have really good news. Turn to the person next to you and say, he's got really good news for us. Because God is inviting us. He's commanding us, I believe, to take risks, to take leaps of faith. I totally believe that he is asking us to do that, telling us to do that. But here's the thing. The best way for us to be a part of the miracle that God is doing in the future is to go back and reconnect our roots with our roots of the relationship that we have with God, to go back to, if I can say it this way, the greatest miracle of all. And that's why I want you to be in Ephesians chapter two. Because we need to go back and remember that we're living out the miracle that shakes eternity, our salvation. Look in Ephesians chapter two. I wanna read it to you. The first 10 verses of that particular chapter, I'm gonna read them straight through to you. Um, They're not gonna be on the screen yet. I'm gonna read out of the New Living Translation this morning. Here you go. Verse one, chapter two, book of Ephesians. Paul says this. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, I'm sorry, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Verse four, but but God is so rich in mercy And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he saved us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in, uh, point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Verse eight, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now, I know that I say this about every other week. I say something like this. This is a really important passage of scripture. Like, this is like the best passage of scripture. And I'm gonna say it again this morning. Ephesians chapter two, verses one to 10, one of the most important passages of scripture in all of the Bible. Because it is a snapshot, it is a snapshot of what happens to every single person who comes to Christ. The journey that we take from being estranged from God to being a beloved child in his family is described in those 10 verses. The first first three verses are like the negative part. It's the down part. It's the state of all of us before Christ came and regenerated us and made us alive. We were spiritually dead. It says in this passage, in that translation, that we were under his anger, but it says in other translations, we were under the wrath of God. That is the state of all of those who have not yet come to Jesus. They are under the wrath of God. Verses four to seven is, the, is, the, is the, the shift that takes place. It shows how a person goes from being spiritually dead to being spiritually resurrected with Christ, to being regenerated through God and Jesus. And this portion has a, this wonderful example. Verse seven talks about how for all of eternity in the future, God will unite us with Christ and he will always be pointing to us as this wonderful, glorious example of his, go- of his goodness and love to us. And then in the last section, verses 8, 9, and 10, they're they're like the climax. I want you to read it with me. It's going to be on the screen. Can we read those three verses again? Read with me. Go ahead. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. So he planned for us long ago. 
By grace through faith we are saved. By grace through faith we are saved. It has nothing to do with us. You and I can't do enough good things. You can't obey this enough to be in a right standing with God without Jesus, without the grace. It is only because of God's grace. It is only because of what he has done for us. All we did was believe and he brought us into relationship with him. According to verse 10, and I love this, so I use NLT for this morning. He says that we are his masterpiece. Workmanship is the word that's used in other translations, but we are his masterpiece. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. You really are. We probably don't say that nearly enough. We're really good at pointing out the places in our lives that are not masterpiece-like. But the reality is, is that God came along and he, by grace, he picked up this chunk of whatever we were and he put it on, you know, on his on his work you know, bench, and he began, as a sculptor does, to make something beautiful out of something that was not beautiful, to make something amazing out of something that was worthless, to make something hopeful out of something that had no hope at all. And, we, and he turns this into this, this priceless treasure, this, this wonderful, priceless work of art. He turns us into that, and then he sends us out and says, go do these things that I have prepared in advance for you to do. From eternity past, I knew that I called you. It's like Judah this morning and, and Juliet and, and Judy. I had to get all my J's right. They were called before they were even born and God wanted to make them into masterpieces and send them out to do things that he had preplanned for them. We're the product of grace resurrected to partner with God to do his work. Here's the thing. There is no greater miracle in all the universe than someone meeting Jesus. Because if we're praying for someone on this board that has cancer and we believe that God can heal them of that cancer, amen? Wow, that was weak. Let's try again. Someone on this board has cancer and we're believing that God can heal them of that cancer, amen? Amen, Amen, we are. But if they get healed of that cancer, it won't be as big a miracle as the miracle that took place when they came to Jesus. Because when someone comes to Christ, all of eternity is shaken forever. That's a miracle that never ends. So when you came to the Lord, when I came to the Lord, that was the biggest miracle of all. And it wasn't anything that we did. It was something that he did. We were saved by his grace. We are being sent by his grace to others who need his grace. Make the connection with me. I'm almost finished. As we step into the Jordan with the pole on our shoulder, walking into that muck and having the water stop flowing, as we step out of the boat, as we place our foot on the Sea of Galilee and start to walk and do the impossible, be a part of a miracle, as this stuff takes place, I want you to understand one thing. This is what I want you to get this morning. I want you to get this. You are not called to muster up strength to perform miracles. You are not called to psych yourself up so that when you're encountering these people and praying for them and engaging with them, that you have all the right answers and you can fix their problem. You are not called to that. You are not called in any way at all to look at yourself and your gifts and your abilities so that you can make something happen. We don't need you to make something happen. God doesn't need me to make something happen. He has called us to be obedient and he has called us to walk in faith. And that's all he has called us to. And it is his grace that will answer these prayers. These miracles will take place because of his grace, not because of us. His grace saved us. His grace holds us. His grace will empower us even when we feel weak, regardless of how big the leap is. It's not about us. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, it's not about you. It's not about, it's, it's so counterintuitive Because we think, I think many of us think, well, if we're going to see miracles, I need to be ready to do this. And by all means, pray. Read your Bible. By all means, make yourself ready in terms of consecration. But you're not, you don't have the power to do any of this. If we could have seen these people healed or saved or delivered by now, and we just could, we could just make it happen like that, wouldn't we have done it? Wouldn't we have done it? We couldn't save ourselves and we're not gonna be able to create these miracles either. What we can do is trust God 
and listen to his voice and be obedient to take risks, even if it's unusual, even if it's a stretch, even if it's walking out into the, into the water, even if it's stepping outside of the boat, because God's grace will always attend obedience. When we are obedient, his grace is there, and through his grace, we will experience miracles. Write this down. God does the miracles. God does the miracles. We believe and we obey. It is not on you. That doesn't mean be passive. It means remember your role. Stay in your lane. It's about praying. It's about listening. It's about being obedient. It's not about you, you doing miracles yourself. It's not about you. I want you to look at a scripture with me. We're almost finished. I want, we'll send this out through email and put it on social media, but I want to, I want to read those last three verses of, of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, but I want to read them personalized with you. As a matter of fact, would you stand with me? We'll do this standing up. I want to make this our, our prayer this morning as we close. Before we do that, let me say this. If you're here, if you're here, and when I was reading all those verses and it talked about being far away from God and being spiritually dead and being under the wrath of God and all of this distance from God, if you're here this morning and you're thinking, I'm not sure that I have a relationship with the Lord or I know that I don't, I'm, I'm not where I need to be with God, I want you to know the Lord loves you so much. And his grace, the same grace that touched our lives, that, that enabled us to be in relationship with God the Father, it, it's here for you as well. It's like the, um, it's like the, uh, the idea of fire. You know, fire doesn't ever run out. Like, you don't ever say, oh, we ran out of fire. Because whenever something gets lit, more fire is created, amen? So there's always more grace for people. There's always more grace for others that are coming to Christ and seeking him. You don't run out of grace, just like you don't run out of the spirit. So if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, there will be someone here after service. I just encourage you, come forward. Let us pray with you. Let us give you a Bible. Let us, let us stand in prayer with you. You are welcome in this family. This is not a club, amen? Grace, we're not a club. May we never act like a club. We're a family and there's always room at this table for you because there's always room at Jesus' table for all of us. Look at this verse. Let's, let's say this together, and then we're going to pray this, and then we'll put it out. I would encourage you to take every, every day for a while. I'm going to be praying this personally. I ask you to do the same thing just as a way of reminding me that it's all about grace. It's not about me, but in Jesus, all kinds of amazing things can happen. Read it with me. It says, God saved me by his grace when I believed. I can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things I have done, so I can't boast about it. I am God's masterpiece. He has created me anew in Christ Jesus, so I can do the good things he planned for me long ago. God has planned good things for us, and we can do them because of his grace. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. We are grateful that it's not on us. We don't have to work up our energy. We don't have to psych ourselves up. We don't have to try harder to be able to be good enough to do your work, Lord. We're your masterpiece. That's what you told us. And you have directed from before time began. You have directions for us and places for us to go and people for us to see. You have desired for us to invite people to our, our dining room tables to love them and to share a meal with them. Lord, you have called us to lay hands on the sick so that they will recover. Lord, you have, you have empowered us so that we can share the good news of what Jesus came and did on the cross and through his resurrection. Lord, we can do these things, not because we're all able in our own selves. Lord, we've got nothing. We can do these things because of your grace. Thank you, Lord, that we are examples, the greatest miracle that has ever been done, and we carry within us the capacity for more. Lord, I pray your blessing on the Grace Church family. Lord, may we see ourselves as part of what you're doing, but not put pressure on ourselves to make something happen. It's all about you, and it's not about us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you extend your hands in front of you? I want to bless you in the name of the Lord before you go this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, Grace Church family, and give you peace. Amen.